Hallo und willkommen zurück. Hello and welcome back to History and Politics, the Körber Stiftungs Podcast that explores how and why history shapes the present. My name is Annika Weinreich and I would like to warmly welcome Katja Heuer and Oliver Moody, who are hosting the special podcast series The New Germany as part of our Stiftungs Podcast. This is episode five of the third season of The New Germany, which focuses on German society and the changes it has undergone over time, such as demographic shifts, globalization, geopolitical crisis, immigration and much more. We are delighted to have Jaguda Marinic as our expert guest for this episode. She's a writer and journalist. Welcome, dear Jaguda Marinic. But now to you, Katja and Oliver. Let's get started. You know, there's no such thing as society. There are individual men and women and there are families. And no government can do anything except through people. And the people must look after themselves first. Well... That just sent a chilly shiver down my spine. It's almost as though the ghost of Baroness Thatcher were right here in this room. <laughs> I'm afraid not, Oliver. This is Katja, your German co-host. But yes, I was indeed channeling my inner Margaret Thatcher. I have to say, the thought of a German Margaret Thatcher is um, unsettling. <laughs> I'm sure the Iron Lady would have shared your sense of unease about her words coming out of a German mouth. Um, but I was evoking her famous argument that there's no such thing as society, precisely because it runs completely contrary to the way that many Germans think about the way that they live together. I think to prove the point, it's now your turn to sing You'll Never Walk Alone in your best Olaf Scholz voice. There are many things I would do for the sake of comity between Germany and Britain, but I suspect a musical rendition of Scholz's catchphrase would only make things worse. Welcome back to The New Germany, a special series from the Kerber Stiftung's History and Politics podcast, hosted by me. Oliver Moody, a British journalist based in Berlin. And me, Katja Heuer, a German historian living in Britain. Today, we will be looking at social upheaval in Germany. The idea that we live in a Transformationsgesellschaft. Well, you said Transformationsgesellschaft so nicely, and I think it's bad luck not to compliment anyone learning German on their mastery of compound nouns. Oh, thanks, Katja. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a drawback to that as well, because every time you use a compound noun, a hyphenated word dies somewhere in the German language. You mean mit Bindestrich zusammengesetzte Wörter? And there's another two gone. Well, apparently German hyphens are dying out, but that's not really our concern today, I suppose. Uh, you were saying? I was saying that the this notion of Germany as a Transformationsgesellschaft, a society in transition, has been a very prominent aspect of the country's self-image since 1945, as has the idea that this process of societal change must be anticipated and managed correctly, which would probably have been anathema to Lady Thatcher. Although I do have to say that those famous words of hers you quoted at the start are often taken out of the context of the argument she was trying to make, which is uncharacteristically a very German one. Because what, what Thatcher was saying in that interview is that people can't rely in the first instance on some abstract idea of societies to look after them, but rather that the, the first and foremost unit of care should be their immediate community, their, their family, their colleagues, their social clubs or whatever. And this is an idea that not only forms the organising basis of the post-war German social welfare state, but is also shot through the history of British conservatism from Edmund Burke's Little Platoons to David Cameron's Big Society. I hope you enjoyed that little lecture. <laughs> It was lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, I do think, though, when you speak to, or certainly when I speak to the, the sort of Brits around me, that it certainly strikes me that there isn't, even on the left, there isn't much talk of the idea of sort of societal cohesion or never mind the, the sort of kind of solidarity that, that Olaf Scholz is trying to evoke with the song that you didn't want to sing earlier. <laughs> um, so the idea that you'll never walk alone because there is kind of the state or the overarching structure of society there to sort of back you up as a kind of safety net, if you will, is, is not so much one that is a kind of concept as prominent as that in, I would say, in, in British thinking. Yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much fair. 
<laughs> I'm glad you, that you agree. I think in Germany there is an obsession with society mainly because the state is so young and there's always a, a kind of idea that if society falls apart, it might quickly become an existential problem for the state itself. Um, so the idea that German unity is so recent comparatively with Germany only having been so formed in 1871 as a state that you know, any any kind of division might very quickly lead to the whole thing um, sort of falling apart. I think that's particularly obvious when you look at social divisions. So the idea of the class struggle, of course, picked up by by Karl Marx, who was of course German himself, um, and then arguing that you know that would lead to an inherent struggle between uh, different social classes in society. The very very strong trade unionism that you get before the First World War in Germany leads to further fears at the top you know, that this might lead to the entire thing kind of unravelling, I think. Yeah. When you get these discussions in Germany, they almost always begin with a famous distinction that was drawn in 1887 by the social theorist Ferdinand Tönnies, who argued that you have two kinds of, of grouping. You have Gesellschaft, which is quite an abstract and minimalistic concept of modern society held together by fairly weak connections basically the, the bugbear that Thatcher had in mind, and Gemeinschaft, which means something more like community, and that is a, a group of people who are bound together by ties of, of family and local rootedness. And I, I like to think that if, if Thatcher had read a bit more 19th century German sociology, she would have said there is no such thing as Gesellschaft, but there is such a thing as Gemeinschaft. And I wonder if part of this way of looking at it has to do with the religious divides in Germany. So at its foundation, Germany was about two-thirds Protestant, one-third Catholic, which coincided with the north-south divide, although those proportions have, have shifted a bit in favour of the Catholics uh, since then, as, as Germany's territory has has um, been consolidated in the western half. Yeah, I think another issue is, you know, back then you also had a very young society. So the fact that population growth was so rapid after German unification in 1871 that by 1914 you basically had a very, very young society. Uh, most people only having just sort of, you know, started their lives really and, and the new outlook maybe on what that should be. It's also the first generation of Germans, if you will, as so people who've grown up in a in, in the context of a German nation state. And then that's somehow compounded this idea of a restless society, of one that isn't really cohesive, by the idea that you have these kind of lost generations of men twice in the First World War and in the Second World War, whereby pretty much an entire... Uh, you know, cohort of of young men um, is is lost either to actual death, or sort of coming back from war completely um, changed and disturbed by the by the experience. And I think all of that meant that the first half really of the of the existence of the German nation states so from 1871 to 1945 is uh, set up by a society that's constantly changing, where the actual people that make up the country uh, aren't the same basically from one generation to the next. Yeah. And another big strand of this that, that Germany obviously has in common with a lot of other European societies is the the rebalancing of, of gender relations from the mid-19th century. There was a pretty cogent early feminist movement in imperial Germany. You saw this a lot bound up with socialism and social democracy and, and figures such as Clark and Sidkin. In the Weimar Republic, uh, women were given the right to vote from 1919, which is about the same time as a lot of other Northern European countries. And you had this this emerging concept of the, the new and emancipated woman, although I'm never quite clear on how deeply that spirit penetrated through, through German society. Uh, but it, it was certainly something that was present in, in strata of the middle classes. And there was a pretty heavy reversal of that under the Third Reich with this this kind of defining concept of, of, of women as as nurturing pillars of the family and this the famous slogan Kinder Kirche Küche, children, church and kitchen, which lingered on a bit into the 50s and, and the 1960s, at least in the Federal Republic. Yeah, and I think this unsettled nature of a society was further compounded by 
the kind of changing nature of minorities in Germany as well. So Bismarck's Reich at the beginning uh, included some national minorities, in fact, millions of people. Um, so you had uh, the Jewish population, for example, making up around 1%. Uh, you also had French, Polish and Danish minorities living in, in the Reich that he forged or cut out of Europe. Um, and then that changes over time because uh, in the uh, 1920s, you get an added kind of minority in the small population of black and mixed race people that began to settle mainly in the Rhineland due to French uh, occupations of the colonial troops that the French had used to occupy the Rhineland after the First World War. Um, they were particularly heavily targeted by the Nazis' racist policies, such as their sterilization program. Jews were, of course, completely wiped out by by the Nazis in Germany, almost completely wiped out as a as a group. And so, you know, not even the sort of minorities really of German society, the people that make up a kind of not very mixed society at this point, are constantly in, in fluctuation. Yeah, and at the end of Nazi rule in 1945. German society is is kind of strangely unified in in misery and defeat and a, a certain measure of guilt. It's a it's a country that's had its minorities largely wiped out or assimilated, as you just said. It's one that has 160 women for every hundred men in the younger age groups. It's got a record divorce rate of 14.6 in 1950. And above all, it's a country that just wants to forget and move on. Yeah, and I think when East and West Germany were, were founded at the end of that sort of period, so in 1949, both regimes were acutely aware of the fact that some of the societal divisions were we mentioned earlier had basically helped Hitler come into power because Hitler was then able to claim that he would create unity in society in the form of a, of a people's community or Volksgemeinschaft as he as he called it. Is it my turn to praise you on your enunciation of German compound nouns? <laughs> well, I'll take it. <laughs> but anyway, I think there was certainly a sense there that in order to stabilise society, the issues that had previously destabilised it needed to be addressed so that you don't get another regime basically coming up promising that they will unify German society into one a great community. So this idea, for instance, of the class struggle that I mentioned earlier, which now sounds a bit, you know, sort of almost out of date, really, but at the time was hugely central to the way that people understood the tensions in society, was addressed was that East and West, basically, this was made a, a central thing to, to try and get rid of that. So in the East, in, in East Germany, you had the so-called dictatorship of the proletariat set up. So the idea that class relations would be reversed and now you had the the working classes running the country that of course didn't entirely materialize in the way that that you know some people wanted it to be to be seen given that it was indeed a dictatorship and actually suppressed much of the proletariat but it was one way of attempting to address this kind of inherent tension that had previously plagued german society whilst in the west a different approach was taken and they they basically try and establish a relationship of of trust between employees and the workers. So you get very, very strong trade unionism set up, much stronger than, than is the case elsewhere, um, where they're kind of directly involved in negotiations over salary and working conditions and things like that. So from the beginning, the trade unions aren't necessarily seen as the enemy, as is often the case, for instance, in Britain, but they're actually seen as a kind of pillar in, in, of, of kind of the negotiation of work relations, really. Both states also managed to sideline aristocracy, which had still been um, incredibly influential before the Nazis came into power um, and are now increasingly yeah, sort of booted out of power and will begin to drop their funds as an, as an obvious sign of their, their heritage and try and come across as more middle class to fit into this new society that is being set up. Yeah. Another thing you see during this period is the Catholic and Protestant churches coming to pull in more or less the same direction as they become moral and social lodestars in post-war society. And you, you see that in both of the Germanys. So in, in the West, one of the big kind of political developments is the, the ecumenical formation of the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, as a party that represents both Protestant and Catholic voters, where before you had had the much more Catholic-flavoured Zentrumspartei or Centre Party. And in the GDR, 
the Protestant and Catholic churches uh, were working pretty closely together first in forming a kind of unified anti-fascist front and then as the the years dragged on um, as kind of countervailing forces towards the, the socialist regime. An important thing to add here is just the, the magic of economic prosperity in, in ironing out social divisions. And there you can see a disparity between the two Germanys, where on the one hand, you have the, the Wirtschaftswunder in West Germany, which eases a lot of the social tensions that might otherwise have been there. Whereas in, in East Germany, where you don't have the same relentless uplift in living standards, it obviously culminates in the the attempted uprising in, in East Berlin in 1953. Yeah, there's also a huge difference in the way that both states addressed kind of this idea of gender relations that we talked about earlier. So in the East, you get pretty much immediately an attempt to try and include women into the workforce and into wider society very, very quickly, much more quickly than happens in Western societies where they enter factories and universities and, and kind of higher education on a much grander scale because that's pushed by the by the state from the beginning. Uh, whilst in the West, an attempt is undertaken to try and sort of support or, or preserve this traditional model of, of family where the husband goes out to work and the mother and wife kind of looks after the household at the time and financial incentives are, are provided to sort of preserve this this idea, you still see this today in the way that people still live differently in, in East and West. So, for example, the divorce rate is traditionally higher in the East, but you also get a much, much smaller gender pay gap. In fact, in the East, it's actually reversed. Women earn slightly more than, than men in the East still today. It's largely due to the fact that they work full time, you know, and kind of treat their jobs not as something that they sort of do alongside having a family, but something that is equally important to them. And so you still see those kind of different attempts of of solving the issue of gender relations in, in the East and the West today. Um, in terms of economic stab stabilization, as you mentioned, this 1953 uprising is a huge uh, kind of sign of how unhappy society was in the East with the economic conditions and how much tension that caused. But when the Berlin Wall was built in 1961, despite the fact that this brought horrific conditions on a personal level with families being torn apart and, and people being prevented from traveling freely, it also stabilized the economy somewhat. And you see a much sort of more quiet and, and calmer um, kind of society in the 1960s as well, East and West, if in very different ways. And after that, you start to see a series of trends that are, are, have shaped German society very profoundly and are still doing so arguably more than ever today. And the really big one is obviously immigration from the, the end of the 1950s, really starting in the 1960s. Germany, West Germany brought in Gastarbeiter, so-called guest workers, often from Southern Europe and then increasingly from Turkey. And it meant guest worker in a very literal sense. The idea was that these were, these were men who were coming to do a job, to earn some money, to send the money back home, and then they would go back to their native country, there was a very strong, pronounced resistance in German politics to face up to Germany becoming a country of immigration or an Einwanderungsland. But increasingly over the years, and especially from the 70s and 80s, they, they did start to stay and bring their, their families and dependents over. But at the same time, this kind of refusal to, to acknowledge the Einwanderungsland meant that Germany was relatively slow to start looking at how to integrate these people into German society. Um, obviously, that has, has changed since then. And, and the new government, uh, I say new, it was brought in in 2021, but uh, the current government under Olaf Scholz did in its coalition agreement explicitly call Germany an Einwanderungsland. And the the scale of the demographic transformation in this sense has been enormous. You think back to 1960, 2% of the West German population had been born outside Germany. Today, it's 18%, which is a higher proportion than at any point in American history, even in the 1890s when, when the US was at the peak of its demographic turnover. And today... 28.7% of the German population have what is called a migration background. That is, either they or, or, or their parents 
were born overseas. Very, very different picture in the East. And I think that's where partially also the uh, kind of greater resentment or anxiety around this comes from. In uh, what was East Germany, that's because their model of bringing foreign workers into the country was a very different one during the years of socialism. So they had so instead of having Gastarbeiter or guest workers, they had so-called Vertragsarbeiter or kind of treaty workers, if you will, who weren't in the country to provide labor in the first instance. But the idea was basically to build up uh, the other socialist countries around the world, which had largely been developing countries so that in the future, East Germany would have a kind of wider network of countries to trade with. So people were brought over usually for a fixed period of time under a contract. So this could be two or three years. And then they'd be trained in a particular skill and sent back uh, into their countries of origin. And this basically meant that the numbers were much, much smaller most of these people who still had remaining contracts in 1990 were simply sent back home after reunification, often with devastating consequences for them as they returned, for instance, to different countries where you know there might still be a civil war or deep poverty going on. Um, but this meant that very few of them were, were still around uh, after reunification and East Germany was kind of incredibly... Uh, socially and ethnically homogenous in the early period after reunification. So even in the early 2000s, um, so well over a decade at this point after reunification, East what was East Germany still only had 2% of people from a migration background as part of their population, mostly a former Vietnamese Vertragsarbeiter who'd managed to stay with often with their family. And they certainly didn't get the the money or the benefits that were promised to them, both by their own government and by the East German one, because their their contracts were s- simply cancelled and they didn't even receive, you know, the rest of the salary that they'd kind of come to rely upon. The other really big demographic shift has just been the age distribution of society, because Germans are obviously living longer, they're having fewer children, and that inexorably leads to a population that is getting older and shrinking, uh, especially if you leave, uh, well, not only if you leave um, immigration out of the picture. Yeah, and this is even more the case in the East, because um, during the years of division, East Germany was already the only country in the world with a continuously shrinking population. So it started off uh, in 1949 with 19 million people and then ended up with 16 million in 1989. And since then, more and more people have moved away after 1990, after reunification. And uh, the population of of East Germany has shrunk further to only 12.6 million, with uh, mostly the young and the well-educated people leaving, leaving a very uh, sort of old and and often disgruntled population behind. And the the last big thing worth mentioning is that how Germans live together is also changing very rapidly. Um, Today, 18% of children grow up with a single parent. About a third of children are born to unmarried couples, which is high by historical standards, although still pretty low compared to France or Sweden or Belgium. Uh, 13% of German families live in a so-called patchwork model where partners have brought children from previous relationships with them. Same-sex couples have been able to adopt children since 2017 and 4.5 million Germans live in flats and houses with people they are not related to or in a relationship with. And with all of these different models complementing the traditional married family with children, you've seen some some pretty interesting ideas from Germany's political parties about how to adapt the legal framework to meet their needs. And the, probably the most interesting of them all is a concept that is being drawn up in the Free Democratic Party-led Justice Ministry under Marco Buschmann of the Verantwortungsgemeinschaft, the community of responsibility that would allow people who are not related to each other to take on some kinds of legal responsibility for each other. But we are we're very much waiting to see what exactly that reform looks like when it hits the statute book. It's also great caused the great amount of sort of angst amongst the you know, kind of uh, parts of the population who feel that this is a, a direct threat to the concept of traditional marriage and family. It's a, it's a very interesting debate and shows that Germany's kind of idea of how to live together is is still 
uh, very much in fluctuation. So, so whilst some of the fundamental issues at the heart of Germany's societal cohesion, like wealth distribution, minority, social mobility and gender relations have remained the same through the decades, there uh, has been a lot of social upheaval uh, affecting politics as well as people's daily lives. And the scale of this transformation is is absolutely massive. And if Germany really wants to stay on top of it and manage this process rather than following uh, the Thatcher model of, of sort of peoples and community or people and communities looking after themselves, it's really got a mammoth task on its hands. And fortunately, we have an expert on hand who has written extensively in the German press about the transformation that society is going through and can talk about what, if anything, can be done about it. And I'm delighted to introduce our special guest, Jagoda Marinic, an author, political commentator and novelist who writes extensively about German politics, culture and society. Her essays and op-eds have appeared in many international media outlets, including the New York Times and the German magazine Stern, where she has her own column. And she has won so many awards in writing and academia that it would be quite difficult to list all of her achievements here. Well, let me try. <laughs> Last year, she won the uh, Louise Büchner Prize. She also hosts the podcast Freiheit Deluxe, is the artistic director of Heidelberg's International Literature Festival. And somehow she still has time to help children and teenagers develop their writing skills in workshops. Jagoda is the perfect person to speak to us about Germany's ongoing social transformation as it has been a central theme in her work as well as in her own life. Her 2016 novel Made in Germany, Was ist Deutsch in Deutschland? What is German in Germany? deals with immigration, identity and society. Jagoda, it's an honor to have you on The New Germany. Welcome. Thank you for having me and thanks for this invitation. And I'm very excited about our conversation. Well, then let's dive straight into this conversation. Um, so modern Germany has often been described as an immigration society, including by those who think that this is a good thing. You've previously suggested that this term might no longer be adequate. Um, how would you describe German society today then? And is there a single term that actually sums up the complexities of it? Well, I don't know exactly what you're referring to, but um, as a, where I where I criticize it, but what I think I once stated is that the whole term immigration society is something that in Germany is very loaded because it was actually always used in negation to something. So when we had Helmut Kohl, the main message to his voters back then was, we are not an immigrants country, we're not an immigration country. So it's a mantra actually of decades that people have heard as being something not to go to. So I think when we say we're an Einwanderungsland, the difficulty is that you always propose an idea that a majority of Germans, boomer generation actually, has been presented as the worst case scenario. So how can you like present something as a good thing, as a developing thing, as a thing that will be what happens? to this society in the next decades due to economic and demographic change when it was like the black thing on the wall you don't want to look at. So I think um, we have to think of some new concepts that make it easier for people not to push the buttons and to not make it so easy for right-wingers to say, you know, they want to make an immigrant's country out of this country and we are not because this homogenic idea is very present in the majority of German society. So what I'm thinking about is the, the politicians themselves try to avoid this it was Thomas de Maizière, formerly the interior minister of Germany, who said um, back then his political party developed the, uh, the term Zuwanderungsland, which is actually just an avoidance of saying Einwanderungsland. Maybe that was what you were referring to. And the whole history of Zuwanderungsland is not to shock their former voters because they for decades have been told that Einwanderungsland is so bad. So come on, let's call it Zuwanderungsland, which means people are coming there but not into it. It just shows the whole psychological dilemma of immigration conversation in Germany and politics as well. Yeah, good. I'm sorry we keep throwing your own words from the past back at you as though this was some sort of Stalin era show trial. But um, you've also <laughs> um, <laughs> you've also written that you really are not necessarily a fan of the term Migrationshintergrund or migration background for your own biography. So please, can you tell us a bit about your, your family and in particular why this term is not appropriate to describe the way you feel about your own identity? 
Well, my family's history is kind of exemplary history for what has happened to Germany when the guest workers came here. So after the Second World War, when they did have to have working class, they didn't have enough people. So they went to other European countries to get those people and invite them to come here. It was quite easy. They got working licenses very fast. Uh, they actually were recruited like today. Steinmeier goes to Vietnam and tries to recruit people. So back then they had they needed a lot of people. And the amount of people that came to Germany is actually tremendous. Like when we speak of 1.5 million people coming in in 2015, and this is so horrible and we're going to lose our identity. Think back to like this, the end of the 60s, uh, 71, 72, when guest workers came, it came up to 20 million people. And that was actually the number of people that came in with my parents. We were part of them. We were included in the last wave coming from Yugoslavia when Tito also had to deal with them. And yeah, what happened? They were here living as non-citizens, I like to say. They had no civil rights whatsoever. They lived like today's refugees, always afraid if they will not be allowed to stay longer. So everybody had to get duldungen, which is something like uh, temporary stays. And so there were 20 million people with no voting rights, with no political voice whatsoever, only maybe the trade unions. I think they were the only ones who sort of, as workers, addressed some of their needs, but not in a way we're talking about this today. And this whole uh, identity of guest workers, almost 20 million people, of, of which many millions went back. It's not like everybody wants to stay in Germany. Many even went back due to racism. And it's a very tragic story because 20 million people really ne never had a narrative. My generation, their children, we're almost like blending in into this society. Some of us don't even want to talk about their parents. You know, there's a whole story of immigrant second generation that say, no, I'm from here. Ich bin von hier, which is meant as please accept me as part of Germany. But it also means please um, don't ask me about the story of my parents. So the whole immigrant story of Germany itself is being deleted by the kids of those immigrants themselves, which is, I say, sometimes um, a self-assimilation, a form of not to be part of Uh, who they were and take the power and strength to change a country, to change the narratives of a country. And that's why I didn't like Migrationshintergrund, because it meant, you know, there's something dubious about migration in your background, somewhere in the back, but in the front, you're somehow German. First, I didn't like this image. And the second thing is, it was actually the emotionlessness of this term. It is very strange that in Germany, language often, I mean, is shaped by these bureaucratic terms. So Migrationshintergrund, if we go back to Thomas de Maizière, was shaped in ministries by bureaucrats because they suddenly had numbers of pupils who were not good at school. And they couldn't like shape it. Why are these like that? And, and then they came up, you know, those kids who are really not good who are going there, we got to calculate them out so we can make sure it's not our kids, but their kids. And then they gave us this Migrationshintergrund and this emotionless cold statistic way to look at a new generation of German kids became the label. For example, in Switzerland, where it's also German, they say segundos, like the seconds, or they give it a more like a more emotional name, something easier, but the Germans made it so bureaucratic. And, and the other thing was, why did we have to label it? Couldn't we address things about education without talking about where your parents come from? Couldn't we just address the fact that they were not educated in the way we wanted to? So the need to calculate them out, I felt, prepared them for further debates more in the spirit of Helmut Kohl than in the spirit of an immigration country that has to deal with its problems no matter where the people come from. For some decades now, there's been this, this idea that seems implicit in a lot of German policy and political discourse on the subject, that people who come to Germany with the intention of staying in Germany will eventually learn to speak German well and sort of start watching Wett und Das and taking part in St. Martin's Day processions. And you can even see this idea in the, the new liberalized citizenship reforms where there's a quicker path to naturalization for uh, immigrants with a reasonable standard of German. How do you feel about this concept of integration? And is the word assimilation looming there somewhere in the background too? Well, that's a very complex uh, question, and actually, because there's two levels. 
On one level, I think it's something we should really talk about as a positive turn that Germany was able to let go of like this, the blood, the German blood. You can't be German unless decades of Germans are running your family. So I think the moment where they understood we have to change that law, become more open. And I even found this law now very progressive, you know, to have the, for Germany in, in such a short time, to have a, a law that allows people to become German after five years, after eight years, when the generation, let's talk back about the guest workers, most of them are not Germans today till nowadays. So they spent all their lives here and never got access to the citizenship. And now we have a progressive law that allows people to become part of Germany after five to eight years. So I think there's a huge insecurity because this paradigm hasn't even been talked about so much because they're always afraid to to foster right narratives. And what happens, you have a, like a competition between the, how do we say, the minorities or the victims of everything because now you have like Turkish, Yugoslav minorities saying, okay, come on now, they come here from from wherever, from India, from when they are Germans, we are not. So you have a, a thing going on there. Then you have those people who still believe you can't become German, you have to be born German. So um, amongst all these um, yeah, positions that are struggling and that are catching political parties more and more, like we have the AFD coming up and others who are trying to capitalize from this, um, they're trying still to think of okay, what's going to keep us together, what's going to bind us. So in this case, I would always say German has this little assimilation or neurosis, like you're only German when... You know, like once they even said to me, like, you think, I think she's the perfectly integrated person because you would never say she's not German. And I'm just like, okay, look, come on, let, let, let me hyphenate me. Let me take my parents along. So you I mean, learn to bear um, fluid identities. You learn to bear hybridity. You learn to bear these things. I think it's a huge lack of my generation that we didn't bring in the culture of our parents at all. Look at the music. I mean, there's so great influences from the former Balkans. You have great influences from Italy, from Turkey. Turkey, none of us in the music industry has managed to come out and shape somewhat of German music in a in a really tremendous way. We have some hip hoppers coming in who have used this like um, underdog energy of hip hop to, to talk about immigration, but not the other cultures of our parents and the rich music they have. So this assimilation thing is something that is there and I think it's important to talk about what's key, what brings us together. Is it the language, which I think is difficult in a country where you you can't acquire German speaking skills in five years the way you will have if you're born here. So that's going to be a debate, and we should rather talk about the how and how to bring in a diverse culture and make it part of a of a of a present moment of something in sharing. I did that in Heidelberg in the Intercultural Center. Because I founded a center along with the bureaucratic center where we did try to create a current culture out of many cultural influences. But it demands a lot of creativity and a lot of community work to bring people together, to bring them with their di diversities, but still create a common ground in the present. Um, you've also written and talked about a lot of other aspects of society. So we, we'd we also like to ask you about, well, we, we'll stick with the Stalinist uh, questioning theme of your previous words, though, at least <laughs> to, to bridge that gap. Um, but one of the other things you write a lot about is uh, is sort of gender and, and the, um, you know, the way that, that we live together as a society along those terms. So when, for instance, the Me Too scandal began, a new conversation in the US about gender relations uh, at the time, you saw this as an opportunity, almost an offer to Germany to have a similar debate. And you suggested at the time that Germany missed this opportunity. So do you, do you still feel the same way today or has Germany caught up or is it still lagging behind uh, other nations when it comes to gender equality? Well, Me Too was was for me because there's so many things in in, in, in in even the Hollywood culture. I mean, I know it's been invented by Tarana Berkey, so it comes from the black community, from poor women. But to see the kind of community that in the USA was possible in this kind of movements was something I hadn't seen with the same power in Germany. So we did have a women's movement, but suddenly there was a huge solidarity. And in Germany, you even had the phenomenon that one woman, an actress, Charlotte Roche, she went out and, 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 and called out a director. And there were tons of other actresses writing a letter against her. So we, we, we had this tradition of how solidary 
are we or how, how much sisterhood is trained in German feminism, especially nowadays when there are so many sections and each has his own perspective. I think Me Too was something, it is a difficult process because sure, I think it's it's a huge um, Errungenschaft, it's a huge thing to have um, yeah, to have to be in court to be judged, you know, I think it is Unschuldsvermutung, I think it, it, it is something I really wouldn't want to live without, but to have women come out and say, you know, but why do you judge us guilty before we have been proven guilty? To come out, why don't you trust us when we say we have been sexually abused? And I think Germany almost missed that, but in the last year there was a lot going on with the Rammstein project. I think there were journalists trying to think of, okay, how can we really look at patriarchal systems and the way they exploit women, female bodies, uh, their power, be it, be it a star or whatever. I think there's something, it took us longer. It took us much longer. When I wrote Shiro's, my book about this, it was really like, I, I was afraid we're even going to miss that conversation. Not only didn't we have women who would come out and say this or that man did this to me, the opposite. We had newspapers having faces of famous women who all said, no, 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 I was so strong when a man approached me, I could like by make him back off. So it was really strange how scared we were of presenting the woman as a victim, but an empowered victim. Like having the strength to say, I've been sexually abused. And by the fact that I'm saying it, I'm coming out of my victimhood. In Germany, we still have the perspective, you know, now she's coming out, so she's the victim. And I think this whole, here I stand and here I speak my truth. And by speaking my truth as a victim, I come out and become the agent of my life. I I, I, I take, you know, I take responsibility. I, I want to, to people to take responsibility for their deeds. That's a huge process in Germany for for us for a society that's not even been used to negotiate these kind of differences. When I think back at Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, when I was there, I was like watching the pre, pre-elections and, and all those topics about are we more scared of a woman than of a black man? This kind of conversation back then was not possible in Germany. They would say, you know, it's discriminating to label her a woman and him a man. But what they actually meant is we are afraid you're going to unmantle the discrimination behind those labels and we'll want to change it. We are a very masculine society when it comes to politics. And so on. Uh, yeah, and another debate that came with with the idea of, of sort of gender relations and, and changing that narrative in Germany is a narrative around societies and how they change and how we live together. So for many people now, their their friends, the people that they live with, um, are as important to them, maybe even more so than than their families. And arguing that marriage and blood relations are exclusive models of of taking responsibility uh, for others seems to be you know questioned. That seems to seems to have come under under debate recently. So the government is debating whether or not to introduce a so-called uh, Verantwortungsgemeinschaft, um, so responsibility communities that are legally recognized groups that can be uh, composed of however people see fit, basically. So is is this in your um, view or reflective in any shape or form of modern society or is this undermining traditional family models as, as some seem to fear? Well, there's also uh, different levels to this. I think a society and the way we shape our laws should be in service of the way people live. So when people now feel they want to have different kinds of living, I think we should find ways to protect them as well. In Germany, you can you have this um, protection of the marriage as an institution, but you don't have things like the French, the Pax, where you really level a couple that lives together very fast and you treat them like a married couple because they also need protection, even if they don't like the traditional institutions. I think um, Germany, the CDU has been ruling the country for a long time, Angela Merkel, they have been protecting this traditions. And in a way, this is a lopsided thing. Protecting those traditions, I don't think we, it, this is anti-progressive in itself. If people want to live that way and that's how they shape their lives, it's good. But if you start fighting against others who want to live another way, 
then it becomes a democratic problem because you don't allow the plurality of living and you don't allow people who leave traditional lifestyles. So I think it's normal that there is a fight going on between these two lifestyles and these two political directions, though I think it wouldn't have to be. Like in, there's other countries where you equalize freer and less traditional forms of bonding and, and feeling responsible for each other by the law as much as you respect marriage. But I think there's another very important aspect there. We should look at the reasons why people nowadays live more atomic lives. So I think when we speak about we want freer, we want Verantwortungsgemeinschaften, there's also a lot of studies where people, you know, you see a lot of loneliness, you see a lot of people living in single households, you see an isolation of the individual It makes the individual very vulnerable to the market, to psychological problems, to whatever. So I think we will have to, if we get freer and the traditions are not the only thing to bind us, and I don't want to idealize traditional lifestyles at all because there's been much unhappiness in traditional marriages as well, but to also think about what it does if we atomize the individual and how vulnerable, even we talked about the trained unions and the power they had back then. Today, it's only the Deutsche Bahn who has this kind of power, it seems. But who is actually fighting for the common interest? And are we sometimes forgetting to talk about social injustices by focusing so much on lifestyle and identities? And are we are we losing sight of, of, of things that make societies better? And that is also economic prosperity for as many people as possible who live in a safe in a feeling of safety and a, and a secure middle class. And that is something that we are losing as well. There's another dimension of personal freedom in the current government's social reforms that I think is very interesting, where we're looking at giving people more freedom over their bodies and what they do with their bodies. Um, you can see this where they've tentatively relax the rules about what information clinics can give people about abortion and the way they're trying to make it easier and less medical for people to register themselves with a different gender. But the one I'd like to ask you about in particular is drugs, where the attempt to liberalize and decriminalize cannabis consumption has seemingly got kind of bogged down in the political process. And I'd be very interested to hear where, where you stand on drug laws, because it seems like one of these flashpoints where there are conflicting impulses in German society towards kind of law and order on the one hand, but also towards personal liberty on the other. That's also very interesting, because something I, I really didn't expect that legalizing cannabis would steer that much debate since there's other European countries who have done it, since there's so much data about the benefits of it. And and as you say, I think that's something, what I, what I said about the immigration thing, these deeply rooted law and order. It was forbidden, drugs are bad, but people drink tons of alcohol, you know, that, that we don't talk about. So um, I think it's rather a symptom of this, as you said, the, the, the feeling that prohibiting it is law and order. So this gives us a safer society. If many people believe the narrative that everything, you know, you have this horrible term coined, Kontrollverlust. We lost control over our borders. We lost control of everything. That it was, Even in the UK, it was present, you know, taking back control, you know. So law and order is just the illusion. We're going to sell you that law and order. So I think the cannabis debate was sort of a, a field to represent this kind of debate to, to, to show people who in politics will be protecting them from disorder, from, from making everything legal, from, uh, I mean, it is scary for me because it really shows that we're going away from all data. I mean, if you look at cannabis, there's not so much that speaks against this. And, and the illegal drug abuse among young people is immense. So why would you criminalize something and bring people maybe potentially in contact with more drugs? And if you look at it globally, I have many friends from Latin America and how they talk about the whole drug scene and the drug problems and the way uh, they're being exploited and have the problems back in their yard. It's a problem that we should look at in very different ways. But the way it was outplayed in Germany, I think the whole uh, cannabis thing was more of a battleground for presenting this idea of, no, there won't be a loss of control if you trust in us. There will be the law and order of the 80s. There will be the old times. 
and that is actually that is the the dark man in the door trying to stop us from stepping into future and progressive laws because we now have these dark forces building these 80s as something that was so valuable and so great to live in and i don't think if they even remember sometimes the darkness and dullness of the bundesrepublik deutschland when you went out the streets and you could hardly find a cafe to have a cake in that they that didn't feel mortal and you really had to go underground there's tons of great literature from Bernhard Fauser and whatever where you really had to go under under underground to get some of the life and how much blossoming there has been in the last decades we talk about this too little by by buying this image of law and order and the, the great idyllic 80s where the dad brought the money back home and all the others could be happy in the backyard Yeah, Gordo, this has been absolutely fascinating and I could personally gladly keep going for at least another couple of hours, but I sense the sash window of Zoom's time limit descending rapidly on our heads. So we'll have to wrap it up there. Um, I'm sure our German listeners will find it very easy to, to locate your work if they're not already familiar with it, but where might English speakers be able to see some of your 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 videos or your um your writing well i had had two op-eds in the new york times so i think that's a beginning it's a kind of intervention that i like to do in my op-eds i really like to look at moments where there's major shifts or major debates and i try to find one line that we can start a huge debate about that's kind of the columning op-ed writing that i love like even the stern wir sind die brandmauer it's an article where then there's a hundred letters a day coming in and people are just asking what they can do. So I love this kind of intervention in op-eds. My English conversations you can find in my podcast, I had Deluxe, not too many, but I have talked to the Indian writer Arundhati Roy. I've talked to the uh, writer uh, Siri Hustved. Um, there's always one English-speaking episode. And maybe the easiest way is my art format, The Book of My Life, where I have talked to the Hollywood actress Diana Krieger, but also to Russian dissident uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky. And we have, I think, every second guest, it's an English guest, English-speaking guest at least. So I think that's an easy way in, and we are working on translating my books into English, and I'm currently writing a new book on, on, on social changes and the radicality of emancipation movements and what we could have done otherwise, uh, other in another way than just yelling at each other the last 10 years and thus maybe opening the door to many right-wing people who love the law and order narrative and can sell it very easily. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you and seeing the debate on German society through a different angle. From. Pardon? You see things from a different angle. All right, Gloria Gaynor. I am what I am and uh, that is a German native speaker. We're not always that great at getting English propositions right, I'm afraid. Did you know that McDonald's drive through is actually a drive-in in Germany? Actually, I did not, but at least they spelt it the right way. <laughs> With all the letters present, correct. Well, dear listeners, it's your fortnightly dose of pedantry here, brought to you by Oliver Moody. Pedantry. <laughs> I see, I see. Well, for more unsolicited advice, <laughs> seek him out on social media on Oliver and Moody or direct your appreciation for our patience to either me at Hoyer underscore Katz or at our gracious host, the Kerber Stiftung. Cheerio from Norfolk. And Jagoda Marinic is at J-A-G-O-D-A-M-A-R-I-N-I-C. Bis zum nächsten Mal aus Berlin. Tschüss.